All right, guys, how's it going? So today I'm in a Land Rover Discovery 3 to try and figure out whether or not you should buy one. The model I'm in today is a late 2006 with a 2.7 litre TDV6, and it's the HSE spec, which is the best spec you can get. So I've got lots of nice extras like sat-nav heated leather seats. I've got three sunroofs, but is it any good? So let's take it for a drive and see what it's like. The Discovery has been around since the early 90s with the 200 series, then later the 300 series. And then after that it was the Discovery 2. You could even buy a two door version of the early Discovery. So I think Land Rover were trying to appeal to farmers really, who wanted a utility vehicle, but wanted something a bit nicer than a Defender, or a bit more luxurious than a Defender. In 2004 Land Rover released the Discovery 3, and it was a huge step forward, because it's so much better than the previous model. It looks much better, much more modern and cleaner, much more appealing. The interior is much nicer, and the drive is its worlds apart from the previous model. I think the only people that still run the old shape Discovery now are people that do a lot of off-roading, because I can't imagine why you'd still use one on a daily basis when you could buy a Discovery 3. You've got a choice of two different engines. You can have the 2.7 litre turbo diesel like the one I've got today, or you could buy a 4.4 litre V8 petrol with 300 horsepower. Back in 2010, I had a 2005 Discovery 3, 4.4 um, litre V8 HSE spec, and to this day it remains one of the best cars I've ever owned. It was green with a beige interior, so proper Land Rover colours. And yeah, I just love that thing. But obviously the downside was the fuel, because it would average about 16 miles per gallon. But it did sound very good. So yeah, the 4.4 litre V8 is another option, if you want more power or more, um, more speed but it will cost you at the filling station. This 2.7 TD V6 is much more sensible to run. I mean, today while I'm driving around town, I've been averaging 24.1 miles per gallon, which for such a big, heavy, boxy car is very impressive. If you get it on the motorway, you'll probably do 32, 33 miles per gallon. So yeah, it's not that expensive to run. Although the road tax in the UK is 550 pounds a year, or 555 I think it's gone up to. Um, unless you can get a pre-2006 model, in which case it's only 320. The trouble with the TDV6 is that it only produces 190 horsepower, so you can't really rush this thing. It just goes at its own pace. And to be fair, I'm sat now on a dual carriageway doing the speed limit, so it's not dangerously slow or anything, but you won't be winning any drag races in it. Not unless you're racing a Prius. In terms of what it's like to drive, it's a big heavy bus with a turbo diesel engine and an automatic gearbox. So you shouldn't get any points on your license for speeding. This one has a six speed automatic gearbox, which does dull down the performance a little bit. I've had lots of manual um, Discovery 3s too, and I quite like the manual Discovery. It sort of suits the car better. You sort of feel like you're in a, a tough off-roader in a manual. The steering's nice and light, making it really easy to drive around town. And the fact it's got air suspension just makes it really smooth and comfortable. Just completely irons out any bumps in the road. A bit like a Range Rover. There is a bit of body roll though. The fact it's um, a big heavy four wheel drive, but you're always gonna get that. Unless you go for a sportier, you know, Q7 or something like that. They're very practical too. I've got seven seats. You get a split folding tailgate. And even with the seven seats in place, you still get a bit of a boot. On the middle row of seats, you get plenty of space. There's loads of headroom where the roof steps up. Inside is light and airy because I've got the three sunroofs and the tall windows. So you get lots of light and it feels quite roomy and quite spacious. It's not a quick car, but once you get it going, it does glide along quite nicely. I love the styling of it too. It looks rugged and tough, but it also looks modern. It looks just as good this thing driving through the city as it does driving through the desert. It just looks at home everywhere. And I like it in silver too. I think it looks clean and sharp. Because they've been around for nearly 15 years, which I struggle to get my head around because in my mind, they're still a modern looking car. But anyway, because they've been around for 15 years, you can pick them up for next to nothing. If you have a quick look on Autotrader or eBay, you'll get one for about three grand, but that will be an early high mileage, low spec example, which I would avoid to be honest. So, like anything of this nature, prices do vary massively. But yeah, if you've got a budget of about 10 grand, you will get yourself a nice one. 
but I suppose it all depends what you want. I would want an HSE with a load of extras, but some people might not be bothered about that. If you just want a workhorse, you might better get in a, um, an S or an SE or a, or a GS or something. This particular one is late 2006 and it's done 88,000 miles with excellent service history in excellent condition. So it's worth somewhere between nine and 10 grand. Now I'd better talk to you about the important stuff, which is the reliability. Because that's where I'm gonna get the majority of my comments, I know, from people telling me how unreliable they are. But again, as I've said with countless Range Rover videos that I've done, that's just not been my experience of these cars at all. So I'll just rattle off some of the common issues. These aren't issues that I've experienced myself, but they're issues that I've heard of. So on the diesel model, you could have to replace the EGR valve. That's a fairly common, common problem, but again, one that I've never had to, um, had to sort out. And because the EGR valve is buried deep under the bonnet, that'll cost you about a grand to sort out. And it probably will go at some point in the car's life. So that's one thing to keep in mind. Another thing is the car's electronic handbrake. At some point in its life, it will fail, and that costs about a grand. Then you've got the air suspension, and the compressor can fail, which, again, will cost not a grand, in case you're wondering. You can either get them refurbed, or just have a look on the internet, because you can pick them up for about 300 quid. That's not an expensive job to fix, and it's only about an hour's labor to, um, to replace that, so that's not a big deal. You've got the airbags which can leak, and then that's why sometimes you see Range Rovers and, and Discoveries and stuff completely on the backside, or listing to one side like the Tower of Pisa. But again, you would just replace those bags. They're not that expensive. But again, these are all common issues that everybody tells me about, but touch wood, and I can't because this doesn't have any, touch wood I've never had to replace. So they're just things to be wary of really. One thing you can do to prevent the handbrake from failing is you can get it serviced. So the mechanics will strip it all down, grease it all up, and that way it stops it getting dry and stops it sticking on. Because a lot of people in automatics don't even use that handbrake, and that's even worse for it, because then it just, just seizes up. And like I say, you're into a grand to fix it. Another common issue is bearing failure in the engine. Now that can happen if you don't change your oil and filter for a prolonged period of time. So the best thing to do to prevent that happening is make sure you service it every eight or 10,000 miles most. Another issue is crankshaft failure, but this can be prevented by having your automatic gearbox serviced, but not, not just serviced, but having it flushed every 80,000 miles. That way that won't happen. And the automatic gearbox service is something that I do on most cars that have done 80 or 100,000 miles because even though the manufacturers will tell you that it's a sealed for life unit, that's a load of rubbish. All that means is it's just sealed until it's out of their warranty and then it's not their concern anymore. And for the sake of a couple hundred quid, it's just done and you've got peace of mind then for another 80,000 miles. So that all sounds worrying, doesn't it? But don't let that put you off buying one because I must have owned, I don't know, a dozen, maybe, maybe 15 Discovery 3s and I've never had a single issue like that but you better be aware of them anyway, because then at least you can try and prevent them happening. But just be careful with what you're buying. Make sure it's had regular oil services. Make sure it's got full service history. Another thing to mention with the diesels, they have a timing belt, so make sure you replace that. I think they're due at about 100,000 miles, but again, I wouldn't want to leave it that long. That's something I'm quite paranoid about as well. Whenever I buy a car, that's the first thing I check and I just get it done because again, for the sake of 300 quid or whatever it's gonna cost, if that snaps, then the engine's just wrecked. I mean, you could be one of those unlucky people who has something like this for three years and every single one of those problems that I mentioned could happen to you, but that is really unlikely. So just do your homework, make sure you buy a, a straight, clean car with good history and you should be fine. And just make sure you look after it because at the risk of sounding like a broken record, all used cars are the same, so if you just look after them, they will look after you. So overall, they're not a bad car to own. I just wanted to give you a, a warts and all assessment of everything I know about Discovery 3s. But one crucial thing to mention is, if you're looking for this kind of vehicle, there's hardly any competition. Lots of people who buy these, buy them because they need it to do a certain job, 
rather than actually wanting one. So they buy them because they've got a horse box that they need to tow or a big caravan or they've got five children. When you think about the Discovery 3's rivals for the same sort of money, there aren't many other choices. You could have a Nissan Pathfinder because that's seven seats, but I'd rather have Discovery. You could have a Jeep Commander, but you have to ask yourself some serious questions. You could have a Shogun, but they rot famously unless you find a nice one. A Hyundai Terracan, perhaps? Absolutely not. No. So basically, the, the pick of the bunch is the Discovery 3. So thanks once again for watching. Make sure you subscribe if you haven't done already. And I'll see you next time. Any questions or comments, leave them below and I'll try and get back to you. Thanks very much. Cheers, guys.